wandered out for a moment. Um, I guess before we get started in the you know town hall itself or the meeting itself, start taking questions and stuff. Um, I do want to talk about some basic ground rules. Um, we had one of these earlier this week, well last week I guess on Saturday, and it was it was very everybody was very uh, sedate, sedate and not very emotious, and you guys seemed like a very civilized, uh, fantastic crowd. But what we're going to do, just to, for ease of, of use, is that we have index cards for the questions. You got those when you came in. So if you want, uh, Ray will be coming around. If you have, if you need another index card, you need a pen. You want him to pick up your index card that you have. Um, raise your hand, and he'll come around and get those for, from you. Um, he's just taking them, and he's, I think, trying to, if you can, group them as best you can in terms of the topic area. But sometimes we, we get multiple questions in the same topic area. Uh, I'll do my best to address everything. Um, so we, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Well, thank you guys for coming out today. I'm Jennifer Wexton. I represent the 33rd District in the Virginia State Senate. So my Senate district runs from Leesburg in the west to Herndon in the east. I have been in the State Senate since 2014, uh, and I am truly kind of an accidental politician. I really don't consider myself a politician. I went into the uh, to, into politics or into the state senate because I wanted to help people. It's why I went to law school. It's why I became a prosecutor. It's why I was uh, an attorney for kids who've been abused and neglected. It's why I became an attorney and later special justice in mental health commitment hearings. Uh, and why I served as a substitute judge in our courts in Latin County. But now that I'm in the State Senate, I bring those same values with me to being a public servant in the State Senate. And I truly believe that being a public servant means that I am here to work for you. Um, so my door has, is always open. I, I am, today I'm holding a town hall, not as a State Senator, but as a candidate for Congress. Our current member of Congress, Barbara Comstock, is refusing to hold in-person town hall. So I'm coming into the tent uh, to do to hold one for her. Um, so if, if, I, I think you, uh, we owe it to you to tell to tell you what our positions are, what our thought processes are, what our core values are that guide us as we go about um, making law and making legislation, and that's I hope what we can talk about today in, in uh, some of the dialogue. Um, Back to my service in the State Senate, uh, a lot of what my background was in, as you know, was public service, and that has really impacted a lot of the legislation that I have brought in the General Assembly. I am a Democrat, so I am in the minority in the General Assembly. Every single piece of legislation that I pass, I do on a bipartisan basis. I need to work across the aisle, and I'm happy to work across the aisle, because one-sided solutions are seldom successful. And I think it's important that we have lots of stakeholders and lots of input at the table. So uh, during my period of time in the State Senate, I have, um, I have patroned over 30 bills that have become law. And the, the, I've been able to do that in my morning by really focusing uh, on things that are going to be beneficial to children and families. So I've had legislation to keep kids safer in daycares and online. I've had a lot of legislation to help combat the heroin and opioid crisis that we're facing in Virginia. I've had legislation to try to find uh, better transportation solutions, especially for those of us in you know, kind of the outer suburbs. Um, and most recently, I've even had some success in helping to combat the school prison pipeline uh, and stop excessive suspensions at our schools. But that's just a part of what I really worked on down in Richmond. So uh, I, am, I am here to hear from you and uh, find out what questions you have. Ray is going through cards. I think he's going to bring me some soon. Looks like we have a lot. Um, I think we have the room until about 8.30, so we'll do our best to uh, get them all in order. Thank you. OK, school funding. School funding. How can we get more funding for Fairfax schools? Facts. Somebody knows a lot about the schools. The state does not fund fully fund. 
fund SOQs and only funds 22.9% of Fairfax schools. The state funds 48% in Prince William and as much as 80% elsewhere. That's true. In 1975, the federal government passed rules for special ed students and promised 40% funding. They provide 11% cost in Fairfax and additional $71.6 million. These unfunded mandates are bankrupting our schools. Okay. So this is a this is really a state issue um, at, at this, well, the composite index, how the Commonwealth of Virginia funds our schools. How many of you know what the composite index is? Okay. <laughs>
to learn, to be collaborative, you know, to have uh, group work, to, uh, to have project-based learning, where they actually do something and where they build something from start to finish, not just memorize a bunch of answers to multiple choice questions. So these are some of the challenges that we, that we see, and I know that sometimes things seem to move slowly, and then you know, we, when you have a new administration move in, they, start, they come in with a whole new set of requirements, um, but I will tell you that just what I have observed through my time in the General Assembly is that we're really trying to prepare, better prepare our kids for the jobs <coughs> of the future, and that's what we're working on. Student loan debt related to education. How can we help our community escape this burden? Many students have loans with interest rates that are driving them into bankruptcy, and they will never get out of debt. Well, it's, first of all, you don't want uh, kids with student loan debt to be in bankruptcy because they're not dischargeable in bankruptcy, for one thing. Um, but yes, college has gotten way too expensive, and it's impairing kids' abilities to, to uh, go out in the world and do the kinds of jobs that they're choosing. Um, I think that the way, there are several things that, 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 that I believe we should do to help deal with this problem. First thing, um, or some things I have done, I think we need better uh, ways of financing school for kids. So, for example, how many people have ever refinanced a mortgage? Yeah, okay. Well, you can't refinance your student loan debt. You should be able to do that. And that's something that I think is one aspect of what can be. We've been working on and have been exploring in Richmond as a possibility with a student financing authority that would allow for that sort of thing. Um, another way to, that, another thing that I think would help keep, uh, keep tuition lower or help, uh, help kids better afford college is by really expanding things like uh, dual enrollment, the community college system. Not every child needs to get a four-year degree. Not every child wants to get a four-year degree. Um, and one of the things that I think is important is to do is to recognize that our community college system has a fantastic way for kids to earn college credit while they're in high school, you know, to pursue certificates or associate's degrees that are going to get them job skills, that are going to get them out in the workplace and employed upon graduation. So these are some of the things that we're trying to deal with um, to, to help deal with this problem. Another, you know, one of the bills that came out of the General Assembly this session also kind of cracks, helps crack down on some predatory student lenders or uh, some of these uh, for-profit colleges that have been going after veterans, who have been going after career changers, uh, offering them certificates and things like Homeland Security, you know, you see them advertised on TV uh, to get a certificate in Homeland Security. But what, what, what does that mean? You know, what, what kind of employment uh, prospects do they have when they get out of um, when they get out of this program? When, they, when and if they graduate from it, what are the um, you know what are the job placement uh, statistics for these various um, for these various entities? And so we had a bill this, this session in General Assembly designed to require that they have that accountability and that the, the real cost of these degrees be disclosed to people when they sign up so that they have a better expectation of what's going to happen. Voter rights. How will you try to increase citizens' ability to vote? Voter rights restoration, early voting, decreasing barriers. Yes, I think it should. We should make it easier for people to vote, not harder. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the General Assembly uh, is that Republicans over the past several years have really stepped up their efforts to suppress the vote. Um, it started, you know, with voter ID, and now uh, reasonable common sense legislation that we have had to expand people's access to ballots to get people to vote have been shot down every year for the past, 
probably 10 years. Um, there has been a bill. We do not have early voting in Virginia. Okay? We have in-person absentee that you can do before, or you can absentee vote before election day, but we don't have tech technically early voting when we open the doors to the uh, board of elections and everybody can come in. Um, but there are a number of excuses that will let somebody vote absentee if they need to. For example, if you're working outside the, the jurisdiction and you're gone, you be gone for I think it's more than 13 hours. You know, you have a medical condition and you can't stand for some period of time. You're going to be out of town. Those are things that, that you're allowed to vote absentee. So I, um, I was elected in a special election in January of 2014. And we had, we happen to have a very large snowstorm on my election day. Uh, this is the year of the polar bar vortex and all that stuff. It was a really bad, bad winter. Um, but my election day dawned with uh, snow coming down, uh, and it ended with eight inches of snow on the ground. So, you know, obviously it would have been nice if people could have gone and voted ahead of time. And I have a number of senior living communities in my district. And a lot of those folks told me, you know, it was hard for us to make it out to vote in the snow in your special election. Why can't senior citizens vote absentee? No excuse. Well, there's been a bill in the General Assembly for at least the last 10 years that we that I have I have patroned and carried on more than one occasion, and a number of my colleagues have as well, that would allow senior citizens to vote early absentee, only get shot down. Um, it's, we managed to get it out of the House a couple times, most recently, this year, uh, it did not even make it out of the Senate. And when we brought it, uh, you know, some of my colleagues and myself, and, you know, and it had been passed out of the Senate on a bipartisan basis years prior, but this year, um, it became a party line issue, and it was shot down on the party lines. Uh, I don't really get that. I think we need to make it, you know, easier. Can you help prevent another government shut shutdown? <laughs> it's not going to happen that soon. Um, let's see. Is it sometimes necessary to fight for an acceptable budget? Okay. Um, so the the, sh the shutdown is really mostly an issue of can we even pay our bills? Can, can the can are we willing to appropriate the money, are we able to appropriate the money that we've already decided, you know, that we're already on the hook for? Is, are we going to, uh, to, is the United States going to default on its debts, on its obligations? Um, I certainly would avoid a shutdown at all costs. I'm, I'm very concerned when uh, President Trump starts talking about that we're going to shut down the government if there's no money for this wall in the budget if you guys don't start ponying up some cash. Especially, you know, when we consider the disaster of Hurricane Harvey and how much federal relief is going to be necessary to even try to bring some uh, some relief and some help to those people who are devastated down on the Gulf Coast. So I don't think that brinksmanship is helpful. Um, I don't think that grandstanding is helpful. You know, these are tough decisions, these are tough issues where we all need to work together, not be coming out and, uh, and demagoguing on particular issues. So yes, especially here on Tet, because here, you know, we have so many federal employees. We are so dependent on keeping the federal government open and all, um, you know, people who depend on that. I mean, who remembers 2013 and how terrible that was? Um, when the government shut down last time. I would go do anything I could to stop that from happening. There's a question about heroin and opioids. Please tell us what you have done with regard to the emerging opiate crisis and what else you will plan to do should you be elected to Congress. Okay. That's a big one. Um, we 
we in Virginia and the nation really are facing a, a heroin and opioid crisis right now. Um, more people now are dying from overdose deaths, um, most of which are, are associated with heroin, <coughs> um, heroin, fentanyl, opioid derivatives, uh, than from gun violence and from automobile, uh, automobile accidents. That is a really serious problem. And Leaving aside, you know, the people who die of overdoses are one thing, but all the many people and families who are affected by addiction and, and the toll that it takes um, are hundreds of thousands. So this is something that has really struck us in Virginia. We weren't fully um, necessarily ex expecting the way that it came on so strong and so suddenly. And we, we uh, the governor, Governor McCullough, when he was when he became governor, appointed a uh, a task force to combat heroin and opioid abuse in the Commonwealth. And this was a very large work group. I was honored to be appointed to it. That um, that had various work groups to address the issue from from beginning to end. Now, what made his? It wasn't the first time that uh, that a governor had had convened such a group or put together such as a group of uh, stakeholders. But it was the first time that we looked at it from anything other than just an enforcement perspective. Okay? So traditionally, when, when, uh, when narcotics and when drugs are involved, it, it, the, the government has taken a punitive, correctional uh, approach to, uh, to, to, gun, or to uh, I'm sorry, drug issues. That is, it's been a criminal, uh, it, it's viewed, been viewed as a criminal as a criminal problem, and things like incarceration and enforcement are the things that we've been looking at. Well, this particular group, I mean, we looked at it from beginning to end. We looked at it from education, from you know, training of doctors, from treatment, uh, which was a big change, and also things like storage and disposal that you wouldn't think about. Well, what you know, how are we going to help people know that these are dangerous substances in their house and we need to get rid of them? So a number of, um, of good, good pieces of or good suggestions and recommendations came out of the group. They've been implemented at different levels of the government. And um, I, have, I was very fortunate to carry a number of bills that came out of that uh, work group and some that just had come to me from constituents. So we have now in Virginia a prescription monitoring program okay, where when um, Pharmacists dispense where where, where um, doctors are going to prescribe and the pharmacists are going to dispense uh, scheduled substances, narcotic scheduled substances. They need to check the prescription monitoring program. We didn't have this, you know. We didn't have this as a mandatory thing um, just four years ago. So it's been an evolution where first it became mand mandatory for the for the doctors to check it. Now the, um, the data has to be uh, transmitted from the pharmacies up into the system within 24 hours, which is very helpful. Um, a number of other things, because one of the things we were seeing is that people were, were traveling from pharmacy to pharmacy to pharmacy to pharmacy, you know, and, and pill shopping and pill mills and filling multiple, multiple prescriptions and then selling them. Um, and, you know, doctors would be done the wider because it was a seven day lag. Now things are speeding up, so that's one thing that has been beneficial. Um, another, some of the bills that I've carried, one was to, to shorten that time to uh, 24 hours. Uh, I have carried a bill that would also provide more services to uh, moms and infants, uh, substance ex exposed infants. Uh, because we had a, an anomaly kind of in our uh, child protective laws in Virginia where if a, um, if a woman had sought any kind of treatment prior to giving birth and she gave birth to a substance exposed infant, uh, Child Protective Services couldn't get involved. They had to close their case. Now, that was well intentioned, I think, because we, don't, we want to encourage, we want to, to encourage women to get treatment when they're pregnant. To scare them away, um, but but by the same token, we were finding that 
that some of these women were, were left without the supports that they needed um, after they left the hospital. Uh, and nobody wanted to remove kids from their moms. I mean, that, that bonding period during early infancy is so important. So uh, my bill is going to allow extra services and close that loophole and allow this child protective services to get involved, but for a family services aspect of things, to really help those mothers get the active services that they need, whether it be treatment or child care or other supportive things that will be helpful. Um, finally, one of the bills I'm most proud of is that I, that I, I carried this year and that passed unanimously through the General Assembly, expands access to Narcan, um, which is naloxone. Anybody know what naloxone is? Right. It's, it's, a, it's an opioid reversal uh, antagonist. It is a, 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 um, an overdose reversal drug that, that has saved lives and will save more lives. So getting into the hands of more people is the best thing we can do. Um, one of the things that we have found, and again, expanding access to it has been an ongoing process that we've been working on uh, since uh, Governor Paul took office. But um, one of the things that one of the things that we found that a constituent came to me because she had lost her brother to um, to overdose, and she had she and her family had then started a foundation with the mission of training people, you know, make, trying to make sure that other other families didn't have to go through what they did, and so um, they were training people in how to use Narcan and and then, you know, explain to them all the things to recognize and the services they can get and things like that. Well, they were able to train people and have it properly administer Narcan, but they couldn't give, they couldn't distribute Narcan to the people at the trainings. And this was just because of a regulatory scheme that we had in Virginia and the way that the substance was scheduled. Um, and just the people had to go and take a, another separate trip to a pharmacy and they could buy it. They didn't need a prescription. They could buy it behind. You know, they would just request it from the pharmacist and buy it. But there was a huge drop off. They were losing about fifty percent of their people. Never filled the prescription. Um, so she came to us and said, um, "Can we? Can you please, you know, find a way for us to distribute this?" And it was very satisfying. We, um, you know, we, uh, I, my assistant and I, we, we contacted all of the stakeholders. We got in touch with from the Department of Health, the Board of Pharmacy, uh, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, the Administration, the Attorney General's Office, and we all said, okay, what do we need to do to make this happen? This is an important priority. And we did. We, we um, expedited everything. Uh, everybody agreed it was a fantastic uh, bill, and we got it through the General Assembly, and now it's law. So that was very satisfying. Um, at the federal level, we need to redouble these efforts because these are all good things that we're doing, but we need to put more money into treatment. We don't have enough. We don't have enough beds in inpatient treatment. We don't have enough outpatient substance abuse treatment um, kind of uh, access. And it's it's a tough it's a tough habit to break. I think mean, we need to to deal with everything from the supply side and the demand side. So yeah. I think you know continuing to crack down on predatory dealers is great, but we also have to make to, to try to get help from the people who are the users, things like drug courts, um, things like that. So those are the efforts that I will continue in Congress.
this is wrong. Um, electeds shouldn't select their voters. Voters should choose the electeds. So um, this is something that I have opposed. I have supported a number of nonpartisan redistricting reforms that have been um, that have been put forward in Richmond over the years. Um, we have generally had some success on a bipartisan basis in the Senate getting legislation through, and it dies in the House of Representatives, most or House of Representatives, House of Delegates. Most recently, um, they put all those bills together because you know the drumbeat has, has gotten louder and people are paying attention. There's groups like One Virginia 2021, I don't know if you guys have heard of them, um, that that are really uh, drawing attention to this issue. And so uh, the committee didn't want to have to, the House, the House uh, subcommittee didn't want to, certain members of that committee didn't want to be on record as opposing nonpartisan redistricting. So they they adjourn without without even taking a vote. So they wouldn't even take a vote on this legislation, um, which I think is a pretty rotten thing to do. So mental health. In recent years, Republicans have told us what we need to do to reduce gun violence is to provide more mental health services. However, having the Republicans in Virginia gutted more community mental health services, what can be done at the federal level to increase and improve mental health treatment services? So this one, this is something that is very uh, near and dear to me because of my work um, doing uh, involuntary commitments. And I did involuntary commitments for many years as an attorney and as a special justice, both before and after uh, Virginia Tech, the Virginia Tech shooting. So, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, you know, how the process works and there have been some reforms made, but we still have a long way to go. In Virginia, the Deeds Commission is working on recommendations about what we can do to improve access to mental health treatment in Virginia. Um, and one of the barriers that they're facing is that we haven't expanded many right? years. So there are hundred, several hundred thousand people who would have access to treatment that they wouldn't, that they aren't getting now because of our refusal to expand Medicaid. Now, that being said, there are still other folks and other things that other people who need more services. It is, it is finally, uh, mental illness is becoming, the stigma is, is lessening. For so many years, it has been, there has been such a stigma and so much shame associated with this, even though it touches every family, really. Uh, everybody can point to something. And it took, it took something like my colleague, Cree Deeds, uh, being attacked, viciously attacked by his son who then committed suicide for it to get the kind of attention that it needed. Uh, there is still so much more to do at the federal level. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the programs in the, in the Trump budget would gut a lot of the kinds of programs, community-based ser service programs, that help prevent uh, and treat mental illness. So uh, I think the first thing we need to do is make sure that that, none of that, that budget never actually passes. <coughs> criminal, just, criminal justice. <coughs> is this all the okay. Virginia is among the very worst states in the nation respect to wrongful deaths, i.e. lawsuits, both civil and criminal, of incarcerated or, and or police, victims of police shootings. The victims are minorities. What programs, funding, or action do you suggest that we deal with this breach of public trust? Um, I don't know that, for, I don't know that I would concede that Virginia is among the very worst, but I would concede that any wrongful death and death in custody is too many. Um, this is
something that has been a real issue uh, over the years. Obviously, um, there's kind of two separate sides to it. There's the correctional side and there's the policing side. On the policing side, uh, one of the most important things that, that can be done is, is uh, on the policing side is, is to, have, to make sure that we enhance and uh, encourage programs like community-based policing. Uh, community policing, when you have police officers who are in the community who are known to them, uh, in improving relations between the police and the officers, uh, it out improves outcomes for everyone. Uh, there are, you know, I've, I've heard police chiefs talk about how they turn things around in their jurisdictions because they got their police officers out of their cruisers and into the community walking the beat. Um, and that, that, you know, that, that made a world of difference both in terms of people who were able, willing to call them and uh, report that things was, were going on and also just feel more protected and invested in the community. Um, in the, at the correctional level, um, I think that one of the issues that we've seen is that Again, some, some of it is bleed over from the mental health uh, problems that we have, is that our jails have become the, the housing of last resort for seriously mental ill individuals, um, which is a challenge to our sheriff's department, it's a challenge to our regional jails. But we also need to make sure that they have accountability um, and that you know, there are protections in place make sure that things like uh, to Michael Mitchell, the, 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 the fellow who passed away who died in, in custody in uh, the Hampton Roads Regional Jail, and then uh, and the deaths that, that took place in Fairfax that they don't happen again. Um, this is one of the reasons that actually I'm very concerned about the Federal Justice Department, Jeff, uh, the Attorney General Sessions move towards private prisons. Um, I feel very strongly that, that that is not something, uh, you know, locking people in prison for a profit uh, takes away accountability. It, uh, it is, I think, you know, the opposite of what our criminal justice uh, system needs and uh, something that I very strongly oppose. Congress 
Congressman Connolly and Byer have both talked about the need to raise taxes to handle it with a gas tax or some other means. Do I echo their assessment? Well, I don't know that I believe that I agree that transportation is getting worse every day. Um, we have made very great strides in Northern Virginia thanks to the bipartisan transportation bill that was passed at, out of General Assembly in 23, in 2013, uh, HB 2313. This has opened up hundreds of millions of dollars to build and maintain roads in Northern Virginia. We're starting to see that infusion coming in and, and building those roads and creating those new transportation networks. One of the things that we have seen a lot of um, and are growing, and we should all get used to, are these P3s, public-private partnerships. So the government working together with private uh, concerns to expand capacity, to be able to you know, take on that debt and, and expand capacity, to take some of the burden with uh, toll lanes off of the, those in the regular lanes. Now, I don't love uh, hot lanes, I don't love that solution, but it, it but it works. It helps, you know, it does help alleviate um, a lot of the traffic concerns that we've had. What we're going to be seeing as a real issue, though, is WMATA and Metro. Because for too long, we've all been, we've all, we, we all being Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia, have been selling our obligations short on Metro. And we have not been funding, adequately funding the capital that's required. And the safety of the system has suffered. Ridership has gone down as a result. And it's a real problem, not just for us <coughs> who have to, those of us who commute on Metro, um, but it's a problem for employers, it's a problem for the federal government. The um, DC City Council, has, has uh, the chairman of the DC the city council has, has suggested a regional uh, sales tax be, um, be initiated to pay this expense. Well, that's a non-starter for me because Virginia, even though uh, we only have you know maybe a third, a little bit less of the of the stations and the ridership, we would be paying half of the taxes. <laughs> And that is absolutely unacceptable. We all need to work together to find these solutions. And frankly, I think the federal government needs to be a part of it as well. Uh, because who, who rides the metro? A lot of federal workers. They're dependent on the metro to get to and from their jobs. And we help the federal government run uh, by doing that. So I think that they need to step up and help us. Russia investigation. Hmm. How can you ensure the public gets information on the Russian involvement in our elections? Um, I am a former prosecutor. Um, I am a lawyer, and I, you know, as those things, I believe, uh, I know that Robert Mueller is working on this, and I'm, I believe that we need let him investigate and that you know that, that will the truth will come out over time. So we just need to be patient and, and that's but I, I do think at the state level we need to make sure that our systems are safe from hackers and we need to make sure that we are you know that our the integrity of our election process, how people cast their ballot ballots, how those results get transmitted to us in the state, we need to make sure that that is, that that is um, paramount. What is your plan to keep government 
agencies, jobs in Nova. It certainly, it, it, it helps that we have such a great quality of life here. Okay? That's why the agencies and that's why the businesses that support them want to be located here in Northern Virginia. We have, uh, and not just Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads and all throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have, our schools are top notch, you know, we have, it's a, it's a great place to live, it's a fantastic, diverse community. Um, so I think it pretty much <laughs> sells itself. Um, there, it makes no sense to outsource federal government agencies out to different parts of the country when they're already here in, uh, in D.C. and Virginia area, so I think they should stay. And, and I, I would make sure that we continue to have that high quality of life that attracts them. Transgender students' rights, i.e., use bathrooms in line with gender um, biological gender. I, I support uh, transgender rights. I oppose President Trump's uh, transgender ban. Um, I, in the military, uh, and I think that kids uh, are having a hard enough time without being bullied excessively and being um, pulled out and segregated on the basis of their uh, gender identity. So I, I support the Fairfax County Public Schools really, uh, in this regard.
should, this is a foreign policy question, should American soldiers be deployed in countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria? Hasn't the country had enough war? So, we have been at war one kind or another for at least the last uh, 16 years. Um, and one of the things that really concerns me is that, uh, is that the president is still operating under the same authorization of the use of force, military force, um, that was enacted by Congress right after September 11th, right after 9-11. I think, you know, if, if you look at the Constitution, Congress is supposed to do that. Um, but it seems that Congress has been perfectly content to outsource uh, our military uh, declarations of war to the White House. Uh, and I think this is a problem. Uh, I think it's a problem because careful consideration should be given before we deploy our soldiers to a foreign land uh, where, where they will be endangered, uh, where some will not be at home at all. Uh, and this is something that should be the most grave decision that a uh, president ever makes. Uh, so that is something that is a, a very great concern to me. Uh, I, whether we're in those wars, we are, we're in those conflicts, we have soldiers um, I, I am concerned. I do not support uh, military action for re regime change. Uh, I think that you know it's that is not an appropriate use of the U.S. force, and it does not seem to have served us well strategically over the past decade and a half. Uh, so these are all real problems uh, that we're looking at. These are all things that I consider, but I will say that the decision whether to send U.S. soldiers on foreign soil to engage in an armed conflict should be, and is for me, the most serious decision anyone will ever make in the government. You say you support women, but have you done anything for them other than to vote for more abortions? <laughs> okay. Um, so I uh, not sure how to deal with that question. Um, so women's women's rights and supporting women. Uh, so let's consider some of the bills that I have carried uh, that support women. Legislation I passed um, this uh, this past session. Um, I carried legislation that would give the victims of revenge porn uh, a right to sue their perpetrators in in court uh, and surrepti surreptitious videos too. Uh, they didn't have that before, so maybe a prosecutor would sue. Uh, maybe a prosecutor would pursue something criminally. Maybe they wouldn't. Um, you know, but these women. Generally, their women were left uh, without any kind of remedy. So my legislation gives them the right to sue in court, and not only that, it gives them the right to get attorney's fees, punitive damages. Uh, that will be a, uh, that will have some punitive impact and will make a difference in, in how uh, how men decide whether or not to post these kinds of things. Um, I have carried legislation that would um, have paid, guaranteed paid medical leave for full-time employees in, uh, in Virginia. We don't have that now. And guess who that disproportionately impacts? Women. Women who, you know, women, especially women who are working at, at hourly wage jobs, uh, who, who have to choose between leaving a sick child or coming to work when they're, when they're sick, uh, and or going to work and supporting their families. I, uh, I also carried legislation. This, not, this, this uh, the last one was not successful. It was shot down in, by the Republicans in, uh, in the 
community. Um, but I've also carried legislation for equal pay, for equal work in Virginia for women. Uh, you know, revolutionary concepts like that, uh, which also were shot down. Um, in my first session, I had a bill that was very well um, received in uh, very well received in the public. I didn't realize it was going to be such a big deal, but it allows a woman to breastfeed in public without uh, giving her an absolute right to, right to breastfeed in public because some of my constituents had been uh, had been harassed while they were breastfeeding. So, um, so I would submit that I've done a lot for women. Climate change. How can Virginia avoid a Harvey? Oh, yeah. Virginia could get a hurricane as well. So this is a good question. Um, this has been a, a real source of frustration for me in the General Assembly because um, there are a lot of folks there who do not want to acknowledge that climate change is real. Um, who do not want to acknowledge to acknowledge that it's caused by humans, <laughs> by our behavior. Um, so that so we don't actually get to call it climate change. We can only call it recurrent flooding. Um, that's how things get passed. And this is really um, not helpful for us here in Virginia because, uh, but for um, New Orleans and that area around there in the Gulf Coast. We are the most vulnerable to sea level rise in terms of our coastline and our assets. Um, and we are even more vulnerable because our sea, uh, our, our ports, Hampton Roads, have, we happen to have a, a port which is a major uh, asset here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but also you know, a very large uh, military base, a naval base, which um, which is going to be experiencing some real problems as a result of this. And uh, and it is a huge economic driver, the dependence on the Navy, the shipbuilding industry, uh, the port down in Hampton Roads, which is the other major economic driver of the economy in Virginia, um, besides Northern Virginia, uh, could be devastating. But here in Virginia, uh, the Republican General Assembly are still uh, doubling down on coal. They, uh, they, to the exclusion of other of other energies. So uh, the past, you know, the, the governor has included in his budget uh, modest amounts for expansion of solar power um, in the Commonwealth. Shot down. Um, efforts uh, to um, to have more uh, energy efficiency also met with great resistance in the General Assembly. So it is it's frustrating. Um, we need to re reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, explore more solar wind and things like that. Um, I carry a bill which would have allowed for true control of solar. So allowed, for example, um, apartment buildings to put solar panels on the roof, their roofs, and then uh, create a system where the um, where the residents of that building were able to utilize and, and purchase that clean power, and that went, went nowhere. So it's it's very frustrating. Um, I think that this is something that that being said, we have made some um, progress toward dealing with this problem, but uh, there is generally a, a perception that, well, it's going to be someone else's problem later on until it happens to us. Uh, and it could be really devastating for, for the Commonwealth. Pelosi 
So there's just two questions asking me if I'm going to vote for Nancy Pelosi, which uh, I got the same questions at the other town hall, and I have to admit I really haven't given it much more thought since then. Um, so how many of you is this one of your top five issues? I asked the other group who was sitting here. Nobody? Top ten? <laughs> yeah. Can they explain the issue, please? Uh, and if, uh, if when I'm elected and if the Democrats take the majority in the House of Representatives, um, will I vote for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House? Who else would be out of line? Well, I don't know because that you're talking about January of 2019, so I don't know. A lot of going to happen between now and then. So the, the answer is. I've got things that are actually affecting my constituents today and, and you know, all of us here today and in the next year and a half and things that are real concerns. Um, so you know, I truly, this has not factored into my thinking uh, and I don't expect I will have to worry about that until I have to worry about that.
going to be me and I'm going to stand for the things that, that I care about and that I know are important to, to families in the tent. And, um, and I hope that those folks will agree with me that those are the things that are important. Yes. So in regards to that like, subject, it's basically what does the future of the Democratic Party look like? Like, you know, like, because after 2016, it sounds like the Democratic Party message that's been going on for so long, like, politics has changed in this country. So, what does the Democratic Party look like in the future? Is there a time for a change? The, the Democratic Party is the party that looks out for the little guy. The Democratic Party is the party that, that makes sure that everyone gets treated equally and that, you know, that you have an opportunity, you have the opportunity to have a, a great education, a world class education, no matter what your zip code, that you have an opportunity to, to, to get a job, um, and that, that, that we have an open and inclusive society. Those things aren't going to change. Um, you know, the fact is that, that some, some, uh, ask, some folks are better at, um, at a negative message message of, of fear and division. Uh, but you know, I I was always inspired uh, by hope and change and by uh, you know by by that message from, from President Obama. Um, I I do think that you know one of the things to keep in mind is that you know President Obama was swept into the White House on a message of hope and change it turned out uh, incredibly high voter turnout, amazing electoral victory, and the Republicans in the <coughs> in the House of Representatives they made it their first priority to obstruct and to be the party of no. Uh, and that's been that's been what they've done for the last eight years. Now now they're in control of both houses and the White House, uh, but they can't actually govern. So you know it's time to stop. To just stop with the partisan, uh, you know, attacks. It's time to just think about our constituents for a change. <laughs> um, it's time to work together to find solutions. Uh, this is what I've been able to do in the in the General Assembly. I I do believe because I'm an optimist uh, and because you know I, I I just have faith that that at the end of the day there are enough folks there who are there for the right reasons, who really uh, care less about who's going to get the credit and you know what's going to be the messaging, and more about how are we going to make actual positive change for our constituents. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but that's why I come and talk to you guys, because <laughs> you can tell me, remind me what's really important. Oh. We are we are running out of time. <coughs> um, with all the new Democratic Democrats fired up by Trump, I think it's a great time to have a caucus. We can harness enthusiasm and avoid the expensive horse race that we would have. In Primary, what's your position? Um, my position is that it's not up to me to decide that. There is a nominating committee who's going to make that decision, and um, and I know that they will make their decision however they decide to make it. Um, I guess there are pros to both, and there are cons to both. Uh, and I'm glad it's not a decision I don't have to make, but it's <laughs> I have enough decisions I have to make, so it makes me happy when there's one. <laughs> so, all right, um, I am going to have to wrap up here, but I do want to stay open. I know some, some other folks might have um, had a couple other things, so I, um, I would love to continue to talk to you guys offline. Uh, we're going to have to give them the room back, but thank you so much for coming out tonight. I know that this is, you know, to, to come out on the, right before a holiday weekend, everything is, uh, is really kind of you.
Thank you. 